Hey everybody. Hi. <laughs> Welcome. And I'm going to talk to you today about uh, where we are in the network of social currency and digital currency or dig digital country currency as social currency. So just give you a little background about me. Um, started in computers in the early uh, 80s at 14 and uh, was blessed to work for a major company in New York, New Jersey area um, and learned how to navigate the corporate C-suite at that young age because my boss was uh, the person in charge of the gate fees in the airport, uh, the tunnels and bridges for uh, LaGuardia and uh, uh, George Washington Bridge and Lincoln Tunnel. His department wanted to stay above and up whenever the mainframe would go down. So I was installing what was called the IBM XT and the IBM AT at four locations, all the airports, and doing that at uh, 14. So graduated high school at 16, stayed in tech, never went to college. Um, in the 90s, um, realized that I knew a lot in technology because I was always the first person that would call California and say, how do we do this? And they would be like, oh my God, you're in New York? Uh, well, either they sent somebody from California or they sent me everything I needed via FedEx. And so because of that, in the 90s, I was sitting pretty and I was like, I want to go out and start my own consultancy and just happened to live in a neighborhood called Fort Greene in New York. And in Fort Greene, that's where New York Online, which became Black Planet, was created. And I worked at a cafe called Coco Bar. Coco Bar was the first internet cafe that black people owned in America. It was owned by Spike Lee, uh, uh, Dana Owens, uh, which is Queen Latifah for her mom, and also Tracy Chapman, Alice Walker's daughter, Rebecca Walker. And so I was in charge of the internet part and the computer section of the internet cafe. And Omar Wasu, the person who created Black Planet would come in and use what we then and today, we still call it a T1 line. And back then, remember, everything was dial up through modem, like all that type of stuff. We were the only place um, in that section of Brooklyn, which is Fort Greene, uh, not really Park Slope, Fort Greene, uh, Bed-Stuy, that section, Crown Heights, to have the internet that fast. So in meeting with uh, Omar and just kind of seeing where things were going, I knew I needed to be in this industry, the digital side of the industry, and leave the hardware side, which is what I really did. But in 2000, I was burned out, I was tired. I didn't want anything to do with tech support, creating networks or anything. I said, what can I do that would really resonate and that was, I love to talk. So I pitched a radio show to 99 radio stations in New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. They all said, nope, I'm good. So the one I actually um, got on is WHCR 90.3 FM in New York. And for 13 years, I was the voice of technology on a Monday, Monday evening called Tech No Color Radio Show. And my co-host was a college student who then Actually, she stayed with me until she got her master's. And then uh, as she got her doctorate, she left New York and we actually stopped the show. <laughs> but um, she said, you should be on this thing called Twitter. And I was like, no, nah, I'm good. Uh, I was on MySpace. Um, you know, I'd been on Black Planet, had, had watched that whole era. And also just a side point, let me back up a little bit for anyone who doesn't know. Black people and um, brown people created social networking. The first social network was something called Black Voices. The second one was Black Planet. And then the third one was something called Nihenta. And the fourth one was something called Asian Avenue. And all of those networks were really specifically for their So there was no Friendster, no MySpace, no and the desire for us to communicate with each other is the bedrock. And this is gonna be very important as we continue our conversation about social currency and digital spaces and showing up for partnerships. Um, we 
created digital networking. We had direct messaging in inbox and chatting within the platform directly to the person you want to chat to uh, before everybody else did. As far as a social network goes, of course, there was uh, Prodigy, AOL and CompuServe, but those weren't considered social networks. They were considered dial up networks. So a social network lives on a web and doesn't require you to dial into. It. So let me fast forward to 2000. Um, my aunt opened a bookstore, which is still there. We, um, my aunt and my cousin own Sisters Uptown Bookstore. And that kind of framed me in a sense. So I'm on the radio, but during the week, my cousin has left and she's going to college and I'm running the bookstore. And in 2004, 2005, uh, books were, you know, $24. They were, the people were buying books and this is just when Amazon had just started. So even though the book business was brisk, it wasn't brisk where we were, <laughs> 156 in Amsterdam. If anybody knows New York, that's Washington Heights. That's right across the bridge from uh, the old Yankee Stadium. It's a very, uh, not so much now, obviously, but back then it was a very depressed area, predominantly uh, black and Hispanic and also uh, all Latinx. Um, a lot of uh, Dominican, a lot of uh, Mexican. And so we had a bilingual somewhat bookstore and we were probably just eking along. But what I realized was that there was not that many people um, marketing black authors. So I got onto MySpace and I started building MySpace pages for authors. And, and that's what I would do. My radio co-host said, you should be on this thing called Twitter. And I was like, nah, I'm good. I'm on MySpace, I'm on Facebook, and I've been on Black Planet. I'm an OG by this time, you know, 20 years in the game. She's so like, no, you need to be on Twitter. So I looked at Twitter and I was like, okay, I guess I understand this is texting. Uh, let me take a name I have from MySpace and see if it works on, on, on Twitter. My name on MySpace was uh, Culture First with a K. Didn't resonate, didn't have any social currency. Nobody spent it, nobody came over, nobody checks for me. But then I took a name that um, I did because in the bookstore, whenever I ended up working uh, on the weekend or I would stop by the bookstore, somehow it was the weekend for the book club. And the book club was 40 some women. And they would ask me, Martin, why do black men do this? Why do black men do that? And I'm like, I, I don't know. You know, so I started wearing a t-shirt that said, I heart black women. So I love black women. So then I decided to do that name. And when you do a name on the internet, you want to check to see if anybody else has that spelling, you know? So I went to the web and I typed in, um, back then it was probably Yahoo. <laughs> there was no Google. And I typed in, uh, I love black women, spell L-O-V-E. Well, somebody else had that name. Guess what? It was a porn site. West Coast Productions was saying. So I spelled mine I L U V. So at that point, I still felt this 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 was this name was powerful. Of course, nobody West Coast wasn't on uh, MySpace, so I could use the name of MySpace and not be associated with them. But as I started to think about it, I said, well, you know, what? I want to create a I want to create a, a difference between them and me and myself. So I did eventually change my name to L U V everywhere and wore the T-shirt. And so because of that, when I went on Twitter, I created the first Twitter name that had the word black in their Twitter name. So I love black women was a Twitter name. And I got into a lot of uh, discussions, we'll say, <laughs> um, heated conversations, we'll say, uh, around black women and uh, protecting black women, giving the space for their voice, uh, always upholding, always being a true uh, comrade for black women. And because of that, I was offered a job at a media company and that media company got me to uh, help them open up offices around the country because at that time people didn't know about co-working and I did. And so I found uh, other offices around the country for this media company and ended up living in about five different cities, uh, Houston, Chicago, uh, New York, of course, Atlanta, DC, and um, now I'm living in Philadelphia. And so that whole 20 years from, let's say 96 to uh, 2016, 
that's probably around the time I stopped the radio show. I learned a lot about our digital currency or what we call social capital and social currency. Number one thing I learned, women tweet the most, women blog the most. And because of that, I believe that most brands are just today learning how to actually communicate with women. I think even now, most brands do a, 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 don't do a great job online. One, looking for women, talking to women, excuse me, engaging with women, none of that. So as, a, as someone who's a comrade and been in this space um, and, and seen, you know, I remember when um, natural hair was, was not really a thing. And as it started to become a thing, I was actually asked because of the, twi the tweets I would do with I Love Black Women to, um, to market uh, the first meeting for what became Curl Fest. And Curl Fest, if you look that up, that's an association of women that come together. Now it's a big, huge festival. But at the time, I believe it was just about six or seven women. And they were meeting at a, at a cafe or a bar. And just having to, hey, Martin, can you let every other sister know on on uh, Twitter that we're having this meeting? And so being in that space of, of always being that person that kind of knows what Black women, uh, Black Girls Rock. I was invited to the second uh, iteration of Black Girls Rock before BET invested. And being on the red carpet, it was a New York Times building, uh, meeting Beverly Bond and uh, all, the, all the beautiful brown and uh, black women at that event, I really realized, especially in that moment and seeing it, it, seeing how Black Girls Rock grew, that we are really undervaluing, particularly in the digital space, we're undervaluing the power of women. We are stifling or muting the voices of women. And what I found personally is that when you elevate the voice of a woman, you win. That's it. <laughs> I can stop my conversation and we're done. Um, but basically that's it. And in order to do that, I found that um, there are several things that you can do as a man or as a, a comrade or even as a brand, right? But on the other side of the table, what does a woman do that's trying to build a partnership, that's trying to get her nonprofit or NGO scene or her brand scene or uh, build a relationship with other women? You know, because we know for certainty that online uh, trolling and bullying has increased. And yes, a lot of it has to do with uh, radicalization and other factors. But before that, in 2010 and 2011, I mean, I remember some of the horrific things that were said online by some very notable people, which I'm not going to repeat, but it alludes to slavery being easy for women. Yes, that was actually said that was a thing. Uh, after AIDS numbers came out, a major brand magazine said more black women should have casual sex. <laughs> and, and, and as the voices of women became stronger and became uh, more vocal, you started to see a definitive line of men actually, and, and black men come out against this voice and come out against, and, and there would be these epic battles. And I'll give you an example. I met my wife in a Facebook group called, I'm single because there's a civil war between black men and black women. And what attracted me to that group was that the moderator of that group, the person that created it, had a great podcast and he was not an uh, angry black man and, and he was talking about women. So I was like, Adam, what are you doing? And I'm going to this group. And I would watch discussions and discussions were very heated. And um, for most of the time, I was um, pretty much on a, always on the side of, of women, but also on a moderate tone. And then I would notice my wife on, on the, other side we'll say <laughs> so but she was she was she was really she was really good and one of the things that she did that i learned um is give you an example now while she's a feminist and while she was def definitely you know uh, very pro-women and pro 
pro-black, um, she also had this caring, this, this concern. So she did something that I supported 100% by amplifying it on Facebook called in February called uh, 28 Days of Happiness. And so she did a post every day and she did a workshop at the end of the week or like a this and this is like 2015. Um, so the, the Facebook groups wasn't what it is today, but she would do these posts every day. It's talked about how to be happy, how to image, how to meditate, how to. And I was just like, wow, you just, you know, and, and I saw her, her, her corner of the world. She's from Louisiana, so she didn't have a big audience. But I saw that that world expand and it was really beautiful to watch that. Um, and of course, after 28 days, I, I rolled into her DMs and like, yo, that was beautiful. <laughs> but anyway, uh, my point in saying that is that what I've noticed is, and I can go, we'll go examine, like for instance, Black Girls Run. Um, was with them, um, watched them grow from a small chapter in New York into two or three or four other chapters around the country, and it continued to increase. And as they increased, um, I watched them become more branded and more powerful and uh, actually worked for them for a little bit before they got the Oprah money. And uh, Black Girls Run grew and from a, I don't know, maybe 50 person movement to over 50,000. And um, and they had meetings and they had runs and they, had, I mean, and it, it grew to the point where you know, Nike and all these other brands were lining up and, and Oprah was lining up to work with them. And this was not a movement that took, you know, four years. <laughs> it it blew up. Like I remember the first meeting at a, a founders meeting uh, for investors and they pitched what they were building. And I was like, whoa, that's going to that's going to that's going to hit. That's going to be that's going to be huge. Primarily because um, no one's covering that. And, and there's very few people who are supporting um, women who, at that time, being outdoors and, and running. So with that being the case, I, I really looked at, I uh, really would suggest you look at what is it that you're trying to do? And even if you're you know, the first one, and nobody else, let's just say um, women who cook food from back home, whatever it is that you decide to do, do it. That's literally the thing. Do it. If you as a woman feel that this is a good idea, I guarantee you it's a good idea. I don't want anybody to tell you anything different. Be 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 um, laser focused on what the value proposition is, why you're doing it, and what do you want people to take away from it? So what's the takeaways that you're pouring into people? And then you just got to do it. I mean, it, it's it's phenomenal. I think that um, a lot of times uh, we don't tell women, you know, what they could and, could and shouldn't do. Um, and so the reason I believe, OK, so if you have any questions or you need any help amplifying your message wherever you are on the Web, just hit me up. It's L. I'll put it in the chat. I'm happy to amplify your message, happy to help you give you some tips on you know, how to build uh, and some tools that might be helpful. Um, just in particular, but we're moving into a new phase of technology, which is called social audio. So audio that is like a social network and it's being socialified. People are listening to what you're saying and then following you. Be very careful. Listen to your gut. If it seems like this room or this what they call a stage is very anti-woman uh they're mansplaining they're cutting women off don't stay in that area like leave and go to a new room a new stage a new club whatever it is don't stay don't allow yourself to be triggered by um negativity and negative people and you may want to stay because of sisterhood you know that's fine that's what you feel you have to do but I will say that this new era, um, I am trying some things called a safe stage. Others are trying things to really provide safety for women. But right now I'd say this era is a, was one of the worst unsafe eras in social networking that I've seen in a while. So be very careful. I'm not saying don't 
but I am saying as soon as you hear something or see something or feel something, take action. Don't stick around. Try to make your path, try to make your safe, your safety the first thing. Your mental health, your emotional health, that is one of the most valuable things we have and your time, right? So don't waste time with people that are idiots, really. <laughs> But thanks for listening and hopefully uh, I provided some value. You know? Thanks for coming. Hey, future Kane. <laughs>